We are hitting the streets to show off the amazing properties of fire. Using everyday items from home to light up the sky. This was fun. What does it take to make sparks fly in a big way? That's amazing. Three, two, one. Whoa. A fire tornado is a force of nature, but that won't stop us from trying to make one in our own backyard. Yeah! Now it's starting to move a little bit. So pull up a chair. This is street science. We're taking to the streets with some burning questions about fire. All right, guys. Dude, let's get some of this stuff unloaded. Hundreds of thousands of years ago, primitive humans discovered fire, and it would change the course of history. And now, these primitive humans are going to further explore this red-hot topic by creating a fire tornado. Fantastic. Fire is a part of nature. It plays a key role in shaping and renewing our ecosystems. Out-of-control wildfires are extremely deadly, but there's a rare phenomenon that can be even more destructive. A fire tornado. A fire tornado is similar to a dust devil, only with fire instead of sand and dirt. Because fire tornadoes are so rare, I want to find out how they work all together. In nature, wind conditions must be just right for one to form. We're at a public park where we hope to replicate this. Engineer Nick Householder, lead builder Chris Jufri, and the rest of the team are stacking 24 simple everyday box fans in a circle to serve as our wind source. And our slow-mo expert, Darren Dyke, will be capturing all this fire on his high-speed camera. So we're gonna be shooting this at 1,500 frames per second, and my goal is that we can see a very dynamic, fluid movement for the tornado as it spins upward. How's it going, Chris? You got a lot of fans here, I see. Yeah, we got a lot of fans, 24 of them. So our fuel goes in here? Yep, fuel goes in the pie tin. All right. And then hopefully, with the fans arranged in the right angle, we can create that big spinning vortex. All right, yeah. let's just play. We're going to try to create a huge twister by adding kerosene to the pie tin and then igniting it. Positioning the fans just right and slightly off center is imperative in helping trigger the rising air into a rotational spin, hopefully forming a fiery vortex. This is what you call a slow burn. Looking like something. It's working a little bit. Once we get the cross breeze to stop, it'll, uh, it's definitely spinning. It's burning stronger now. Oh. It's starting to cease the spiraling. Yeah, yeah. In that vortex. Yeah. There it is. Look at it, sucking it up and everything. There we go. Whoa, yeah! <laughs> Not too bad. Are you yes. proud of your creation? I'm, I'm pleased. It looks pretty nice. Darren has slowed down time, which reveals the swirling forces of air that go into creating this rare phenomenon. The slow motion shot reveals that our fire tornado reaches an impressive height of about 10 feet before the crosswinds cause it to dissipate. So what I'm seeing here when I look back at the footage is that the cross breezes are coming in and hitting the fire tornado and just kind of bending it over and taking the vortice off axis so it can't be very stable at all. We want to try to make this even bigger. So we're calling in the pros. So I work at a science museum and we do a small scale demonstration like this. And what we talk about is that this happens. This happens in real world situations where a brush fire will start. And then when that cool air blows in through the trees, it can really send it up and cause a lot of damage. When you talk about forest fires, you have that warm, dry air that stays low. Then you introduce the fire, and that generates more heat. Those cool airs come in, and that actually creates your vortex up. That's why it's always important to make sure your campfires are out before you leave. Absolutely. Absolutely. In nature, this cool air can push fire tornadoes to reach heights of about 50 feet. And in extreme situations, it can even stretch a mile high. So what causes them to reach such extraordinary heights? We're going downtown where the taller buildings will block the wind to see if we can reach those heights. Here it goes. There we go, yep. 
All right, ready? Go for it. Wow. Starting to get there. See, it's pushing a little bit this way. Whoa. A lot bit this way. The angled fans are forcing cool air to push upwards against the rising hot air from the fire. Oh, watch That's, out. That is nice and toasty. Well, you weren't kidding about those metal fans moving the air a lot faster. Look how fast it's moving. Man. Right. As soon as like we get a big cross breeze, though, it just squashes the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. Right. Let's adjust it a little bit. Move this in a little closer, giving it a, a counter push. See, that's the thing. When you have all this wind, it's going from the other angles. You have to offset where the wind is pushing from the fans. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Now it's starting to move a little bit. There we go. Look at that. Wow. Darren's shot from the thermal cam reveals just how hot the flame is getting. You can see about a 2,000 degree difference between the hot air and the cool air. This is better than at the park. This is way better than at the park. Yeah, that's starting to move a little bit, huh? We've doubled the size of our tornado to 20 feet just by getting out of the wind and moving the fans in closer. And you can also see the vortex in the soot. Yeah. As the fire's moving up, it's chasing that unburned fuel to try to burn it. That's fantastic. So we have the fans pushing a ton of wind around the fire. So as it goes up, it can go much, much taller because the black soot at the top of the fire is basically unburnt fuel. When the wind conditions are just right, the fire wants to start reclaiming the unburnt fuel, creating our massive man-made fire tornado. But if that wasn't enough, Nick wants to take it a step further to see if he can reveal something we can't normally see. The best decision we can make now is to fly a quadcopter through it. <laughs> I'm so down, dude. Kevin has a poor opinion of these things, and he may be rooting for it to catch fire. No, I'm not rooting for it to catch fire because I don't want it to hurt anybody. OK. <laughs> My advice is don't blow up the battery. <laughs> yeah. So that's like a 50-50 chance of happening right now. Hey. So don't do that. Hey, I like all the confidence you have in me. Yeah, so much. <laughs> Let me know when to go, Darren. Three, two, go. <laughs> you all right? <laughs> I'm good. We're warm, but it looks to have survived. Our high speed footage reveals that the fire tornado winds are moving rapidly in an upward spiraling motion. As the drone slices through our tornado, we can see that the rising updraft of fiery wind forces it to experience major air turbulence. You can actually see that the drone gets pushed into the fire tornado's circular wind pattern for a split second, rendering the copter uncontrollable. <laughs> fire is always more impressive in lower light, so we wait till sundown for a more dramatic presentation. Oh, look at that. That's so sick looking. Wow. Oh, that's amazing. Now that is an effect most of us will never see in the wild because we'd be in the middle of a forest fire, which is something I hope never to be. Do not try this at home. So uh, next campfire at your house, fire yeah. vortex and hot dogs and s'mores. Sounds, Sounds good, yeah. When you're experimenting with fire, you have to be ready for anything. We carry CO2 fire extinguishers to every experiment, just in case. To put out a fire, this CO2 fire extinguisher quickly releases a mixture of liquid carbon dioxide at about 825 pounds per square inch, which equals a lot of force and produces a lot of thrust. It's the same basic principle underlying rocket propulsion, and Darren is going to see if he can use it to take off. Putting it on over my beanie, extra cushion. <laughs> Three sizes too small right now. Three sizes too safe. <laughs> my biggest fear right now is that it's going to snag my beard hairs. That's your biggest fear? <laughs> Ever wonder what happens when you rig an office chair and a fire extinguisher to a pallet with ropes and sandbags? Well, we're doing it for you. We're never going to get our money back for this chair. Lastly, them goggles. Good for you. You look like a, a dog in space. I feel cheesy levels of safe right now. Well, you look cheesy Ugh. levels of safe. All right, so this sucker up here. 
Newton's third law. Yeah. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Gas comes this way, you go that way. All right. All right, I'm gonna back up. What did you have for lunch? Ah, uh, dude, enchiladas. Santa knows it's amazing here. enchiladas. Okay. Three, two, and. Whoa. This is fun. Woo! <laughs> Feel like I'm gonna fly out at some point here. CO2 fire extinguishers have surprising thrust. Opening up the valve on the fire extinguisher and allowing pressurized contents to escape is similar to the basic operating principles of a rocket engine. When the liquid CO2 inside expands into a gas, the carbon dioxide pushes out and creates thrust. All right, that was uh, dizzying. Good job, buddy. <laughs> so it works without a person and it works with a dummy. Yes. You get more dizzy on this than like the craziest roller coasters. You got all that cochlear fluid <laughs> splashing around inside of your head. <laughs> dizzy, I know. You may have noticed the ice crystals on the side of the CO2 extinguisher, but why does the CO2 extinguisher become so cold? This is because the CO2 inside the tank is mostly liquid. When the gas above the liquid is expelled, its sudden drop in pressure causes its temperature to decrease rapidly. The blue area on the FLIR thermal camera is the coldest, with temperatures that can get down to approximately 60 degrees below zero. It really shows you how much of that CO2 these little tanks can uh, That is force an impressive out. amount of CO2, for right. sure. Well, they're not really for spinning around in a chair like a moron. <laughs> We know that a CO2 fire extinguisher can expel gas somewhere between 800 and 900 pounds of pressure per square inch. In comparison, the pressure inside of a champagne bottle is typically between 60 and 90 pounds per square inch, meaning that the extinguisher is capable of providing as much as 10 times more thrust than the champagne bottle. So these fire extinguishers expel a lot of pressure. But how fast can that amount of pressure make someone go? I know one dude with a skateboard who's ready to find out. Woo! We're heading over to the Riverwalk to see how fast Darren can go. Will he extinguish any doubts about his skateboarding ability? We're clocking him at 20 miles per hour. Allowing the pressurized contents to escape is what propels him at this speed. Most of the thrust from the fire extinguisher is consumed, overcoming friction and air resistance. But if Darren tried this in outer space, where there's no atmosphere or friction, the same fire extinguisher would have him traveling at hundreds of miles per hour very quickly. I say that's sufficiently frosted Nicely over. Nicely done. Nicely done.